Hi. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Nina. I'm a composer. Um, but today I'm going to start by playing the violin a little bit. And I'm going to talk about how um, I make stuff and that Max happens to be a really great environment for me to create, to make, to execute, to distribute, um, and more recently to improvise um, in. And um, it's just been this tool that I've been using since 2004 uh, and, and grow a deeper and deeper relationship uh, with it, I think, with every project that I do. Um, and so for me, I, well, I'll talk about this in a second. We're gonna start with some music. Originally, Todd Reynolds uh, and I were going to do something that seemed like a really good idea, but then I was worried about tech and we didn't have any time to put stuff together. So instead, um, I'm gonna hack through a little excerpt of a piece of mine called Sun Propeller that I wrote in 2011 um, for violin and electronics. Uh, you'll see the patch here. Um, and it's a piece that uh, was inspired a little bit by tube and throat singing, so the idea that you have a drone tone. Um, and through filtering uh, with the larynx in your throat, um, you can create these melodies on top of the drone. Um, so it's you know a computer music application, but analog style. Um, and I thought, okay, it'd be like really interesting to make a piece for violin like this, but the violin doesn't necessarily function that way. Um, so instead, I decided to look at the violin and to detune it to this giant D violin. So the lower string is D, D, A, D. So it becomes this big drone. Um, and then with the aid of electronics to help and harmonics, I'm able to filter these sounds and to create sort of textures with a rather limited vocabulary um, of harmony. So here goes. I haven't, I've actually never done this in public before with this one. So you're my test audience. <laughs>
Thank you. It's really not that deserving of applause. Um, it's a little shaky. Um, but it's, it's actually fun for me to do this in front of you because um, I wrote this piece for other violinists who can play much better than me, but I wrote the entire thing on my instrument, improvising and running a series of max patches during the creative process that helped me build the modules and the language and actually the music notation that came afterwards. So I would sit around with this detuning, playing, trying things out, figuring what they would look like, sound like, process them, and then say, okay, how can I translate that into music notation for more conventional, traditional players to play, and then apply process to them afterwards. So it's sort of this recursive practice where it really starts with sound, put the sound in the laptop as sort of a sculpting playground, then analyze what happens there, and then put it all back into the same system for performance. So I'm going to close this because that runs only in Mac 7. I haven't updated it yet, and it makes me a little... I like, I like Max 8 a lot better. Um, okay, so going back to um, more of the presentation, part of this. So a big question that I ask myself all the time is what am I doing and what am I making? Because I call myself a composer, but that has a connotation of being a composer with a capital C, which means I sit around at a desk and, um, you know, by myself in the ivory tower and I write notes on a page and then I give them to performers and I'm supposed to be this like demagogue character and I think that's absolutely horrible and it's not true. Um, and so I want to know, like, what am I making and why and what tools, which instruments, which people, which technologies am I using to say what I want to say the best with my project? Um, so I have to ask myself, like, how did I get into this whole mess and, like, why am I here doing any of this? Um, so it started out when I was a kid. I uh, played the violin, which you just actually saw me do in public. I don't do that much anymore. Um, and I had a very conservative music education. I did all the right things. And I didn't even know that there were uh, contemporary composers other than John Williams, because um, my teacher kind of cut it off at Prokofiev, because she was like, well, that's how you get an orchestra job. Um, but at the same time, I was also like really into math and physics, and uh, through a very roundabout sort of twisted thing, I ended up studying ocean engineering at MIT for my bachelor's. Um, and so that, that's not marine biology or anything like that. That's mechanical and electrical engineering for the water, so you study a lot of acoustics. Uh, at the same time, I was sort of, I needed an outlet, um, and so I was still doing music stuff on the side, and that's when I first had my uh, encounter with the electronic music studio and with Max, and then I eventually started working for Todd Mac over at the MIT Media Lab, which is where I started building systems for interactive performance, not knowing that I was allowed to do that for my own projects until somebody else cued me in. They're like, oh, you don't have to just make stuff for Todd, you can make stuff for you too. And I was like, oh, wow, what an idea. Um, <laughs> So my sort of relationship with making art with sound has been the, this um, really big battle between the traditional practice, which I absolutely love. Um, I think music performance is a really special thing and that, you know, even the idea of the orchestra, which might be archaic, is one of the biggest inventions um, of Western civilization. You know, we get 40, 50, 60, 70, 100 people on stage and they're working together as a giant resonating body to make sound. I mean, that's really amazing. Talk about an interactive system. Um, but at the other end of the coin, I really, uh, you know, like technology, I like mediating my work with that. Um, and by that I mean, you know, contemporary, like current technology with the computer, because the violin is a, a a amazing piece of technology too, but I'm trying to figure out what does this mean. So in my own practice, I write acoustic instrumental music, I write electroacoustic music, so mixed music, the music that takes the two together, um, and then I do uh, more just computer and electronic music work as well, but lately these things have been merging um, into one practice. And for me, whenever I'm working in one of these other media, media, I try to consider the techniques and the practice and the vocabularies of the other. So when I am writing an orchestra piece, I'm thinking about uh, frequencies and ring modulation more than I am about instrumentation because it's all studio production at the end. Um, and so I want to start, you, you heard this piece for violin. It has a lot of resonance in it, um, and resonance is important to me. Um, and that's because my biggest influence is my first sonic memory, which is that of bells ringing. I grew up uh, in Nyack, New York, just a block away from a Russian Orthodox church, and I heard uh, the bells ringing all the time, and this was, I was just enchanted by them in many ways. Um, and so I'm gonna show you uh, 
this sort of an older practice of mine where, where this all started with me wanting to expand what performers could do on stage in a traditional setting. Um, so I'm going to show you a piece for two pianos and electronics called Kolokol, which means bell in Russian. Um, and it's inspired by uh, the bells that hang at uh, Lowell House at Harvard University. Um, that actually originally come from the Danilov Monastery, but not really anymore because um, in 2008, this is how I found out, found out about this, there was an article in the New Yorker that talked about how Russia called Harvard and wanted their bells back. Um, so the bells hung at uh, Danilov Monastery for a very long time, uh, and then after the Russian Revolution, uh, a lot of these uh, sort of icons of the past, of which bells are a sonic icon, um, that are physical were being hidden or repurposed and bells are made of metal So they're it's really easy to melt them down and repurpose them into artillery There's an American industrialist named Harold R. Crane who decided to save the bells secretly in the middle of the night um, And ship them over to Harvard who hosted them for many years took care of them um, I believe Hans Chuchku is here. He actually did a recording recordings of the original set of bells So the, for those of you with very sharp, keen ears, um, these bells should sound a little different than Western bells that you'll hear um, more commonly, and that's because they have different enharmonic qualities as a result of the slightly different alloys that um, occur uh, or are practiced in the making of uh, Eastern tradition bells. Um, and so I thought these bells were pretty cool. I thought the story was interesting, and I looked at the piano. I was like, well, what is the piano but a giant bell in a box? Uh, because it's a wooden box um, and it's a string instrument, but it's also a percussion instrument. And if you put the damper pedal down and you play a giant cluster of chords, what do you get? The most beautiful ADSR envelope that looks just like a bell. And I thought, okay, so I have two pianos. I'm going to make antiphonal bell music. Um, and so I went over to Lowell House and I did field recordings of the new set of bells and actually compared them with uh, Hans's bells. And the new ones are, in fact, uh, cleaner better, they're not as broken. Um, so here you can hear them, 17 bells. So I brought these into the studio, I started listening to them, I started to play with them, I started to think about what lives inside these bells. It was making all these electroacoustic maquettes, it was processing them, but then I was like, okay, now I actually have to do something with pianos, yikes, how do I do this? You know, I can't just have bells playing in the piano. I mean, it could, but it didn't seem very interesting to me. So I decided to analyze um, the recordings of each of these bells for their spectral qualities, so to find out exactly which frequencies were playing at which times during the entire um, envelope of the bell. Um, and then I created 17 virtual pianos that you could trigger with MIDI um, using a software called Piano Tech, where you can, um, so there, each of the bells have, have these funny tunings. I got all the um, data for them, and then I created Scala tuning files that I put into this program. And so then I was playing MIDI keyboards or sending any MIDI data, you could have these sort of virtual pianos that are resonating just like the bell that they match to, um, plus all the sympathetic resonances as well. And I thought that was really fun. Uh, but you have two pianos on stage, and I couldn't possibly have 17 pianos that are detuned to these. So I thought, what do I do? Well, I put a speaker underneath the two pianos that's facing up at the soundboard. So when the virtual pianos play, it'll mesh with what the actual pianos are playing and sort of create this fuzzy and harmonic quality that is very much like the Russian bells themselves, or even like what the effects that we get with a Balinese gamelan if you hear it playing. Um, and, you know, and then, of course, yeah, I have to give the musicians notes. So I analyzed this um, at the time using open music, although I'd probably use Bach and Cage now, um, and made all these maps and then created some stuff for people to play. And so we'll listen to a little bit of this.
what uh, Matthias Trotsky was saying yesterday. I think it's really weird that we use loudspeakers that are made out of paper to play music, especially when like other people are on stage. Um, so for me, the idea of localization of sound and how, if you're going to use um, sort of interactive electronics, where do the sounds come out of and how, what, how do they relate to where the performers are actually situated? So in this case, there is one speaker hap um, that is um, underneath the pianos that is resonating these sounds to allow the instruments to perhaps help to diffuse the sound. And then the pianists are sitting um, opposite of one another and there's a lot of hocketing that happens later in the piece. So you have this antiphony. Um, and then a, a pair of speakers is right behind them to sort of accentuate um, what they're doing. And then there are two speakers in the hall to help add resonance and fill in the acoustic environment as though um, it was just from the performers. Because if you're playing, um, not in a place like this, but in a um, concert hall that is actually meant meant to diffuse sound from stage to everyone, and then you start putting speakers in a hall, you end up with this idea of space in a space, and it doesn't always work. Um, and so I try to think very carefully about um, not using that as the default. I mean, sometimes that's a really fun trick, and that can be a, a great art project, but it's not always what we have to do. So how do you blend the sounds of live musicians on stage? And I don't know, it's a, it's a long journey, um, and it's taken many different routes uh, in the interim. So. Um, just a couple of years ago, I graduated from two large grand pianos to two toy pianos, um, a piece commissioned uh, by the LA Phil for the Hockett Ensemble called Tete a Tete. Um, and in this piece, they asked me to write for two toy pianos, and I thought, okay, what a joke, um, literally. But, uh, and toy pianos are funny, so they sent me toy pianos, and I listened to them, and they sound like little bells in a box. Um, and so I thought that was kind of fun, and I thought, all right, I, but this, the sound is going to get tiresome. You can only tinkle for so long, so I wanted to do something um, with electronics and really play with this idea of these like little typing machines and what this could mean. Um, so I started thinking about, like, well, what is chamber music? Chamber music is this sort of communication between two people, especially if they're sitting across from each other. They're kind of texting each other, writing each other messages and letters. So, and I was thinking about the rate in which communication um, happened, particularly distance communication. So we used to like, write letters to each other and send them uh, in the post or on, you know, the carrier pigeon or whatever you were going to do, um, and you take a lot of time to think about what you were going to write, and then you send it, you read it, you receive it, so on and so forth. Um, then we sped up the process a little bit when we got telegra uh, yeah, telegraphs, so you could start to you know, text each other in really, really, really slow time. Um, but you know, it was, it was faster, it's very exciting. Um, and then we sort of left the idea of the written word, and we were really excited about the telephone and how we could communicate voice. But funny enough, um, we have descended away from sound um, back into texting each other, and now we've decided that words are also a little lazy, so we just uh, you know, send each other pictures. Um, and, and I thought that this was, a little funny, and I was thinking, well, what does it mean to even have music performance? I mean, all of these sort of ideas of gathering, even a space like this, this is a ritual. You're all sitting here, and, and you're getting ready to have this experience with some kind of entertainment or somebody who's getting you to think about something. And so when you go to a concert hall, you have these people on stage, and we actually put our devices away for a second, and we're listening and watching other people communicate. Um, is it ritual? Is it religion? Is it voyeurism? I'm not quite sure. Um, so I thought, you know, when you have two, two pianists, they're kind of doing the same thing, and oftentimes they're so involved in their music notation that they have on the stands that it's more like they're looking at their cell phones. Um, sometimes they do other things like crawl into each other's phones or break into each other's phones, which is interesting too. Um, and so I was like, okay, I have these toy pianos. What does this look like? It looks like a typewriter um, or some kind of keyboard, MIDI keyboard, compu uh, computer keyboard. And so I thought, okay, they're going to write, type each other sonic messages, um, but then they have to send them. And so you have all of your annoying friends who don't know how to silence their phone, and you have a ding. Well, is that not like the typewriter? And when you're done typing, you have to go to the next line, you ding. So I decided to get some desk bells and put them on the toy pianos as well. Now, toy pianos have a really, really dinky, annoying sound. Um, and I was thinking, what is some sort of way where I can mediate this and make them larger than life? Um, you know, so our phones become this really big, important part of our existence, but they're these tiny little objects you can put in your pocket. So I decided to put a contact mic on the soundboard uh, inside the high-end grand toy piano that I had here, the Schoenhut 37. It's like, mwah. Um, 
And so if I put, instead of just amplifying them even with a mic like this, I put the contact mic on the soundboard and I close the lid and then it becomes this giant resonating chamber. So I have built in sort of acoustic sonic space into the instrument itself um, and then can just send the signal both to the loudspeakers um, and into the performance. And it's very comical, especially if tall people play these little machines. Um, then there was this whole idea that happened at one point. I was like, okay, cool. So I actually want them to text uh, emojis with each other. So developed this sort of keyboard um, that would allow you to, uh, you know, map MIDI note numbers uh, to uh, different emojis. But um, if you ever try pitch tracking a toy piano, it's just really bad news um, because it's just filled with unharmonic tones. There are other solutions to this, but there weren't at the time. Um, so then. Um, I wrote, I wrote this music, um, and we'll listen to a little bit of it. Um, and so they basically, they send each other sonic messages, send them with a ding, and go back and forth. And they are the Hockett Ensemble, so they have to hock it with one another, too. Um, so this is, you know, I'm supposed to show Max Patch. This is the performance patch. Um, and uh, uh, Luc Dubois also collaborated on this. Um, he decided that it would be really fun to make a video patch that would sort of represent the binary communication that was going back and forth from them. So we're going to look now. You'll see a little um, uh, video of what this looks like in performance with two screens and the premiere. But now I will begin the piece, and we can see a video rendering of um, what it looks like. Okay, so I'm just gonna <clears throat> pause there for a second. And I'm going to return to this uh, sort of the front end of the Max Patch. Um, so a lot of what I do is make pieces for performers to play, and I have to think about how they're going to do it without me there. 
Um, and so I have to create sort of systems and environments that are easy for people who don't have uh, years and decades of experience and how do they get their laptop plugged in together into an interface with microphones and trigger all of these sorts of things. So like when I'm making patches for myself, they can be a total mess, but when I make them for other people, they have to be like really clean and nice and user friendly. Um, and I actually think that's one of the great things about Max is I don't have to worry about um, the software configurations or licenses for someone else to use the product. I can sort of make the user interface that I think is um, most logical for whatever I need the people to do um, and sort of automate a bunch of features um, that is like an estimate of what they need um, and, and ways to adjust parameters for different performance settings, which I don't think is something that would be possible in many other um, kinds of, of audio software applications. Um, so we did that. Um, now I'm going to, uh, so these are pieces that all have to do with performers um, and processing their sound and then sending the sound out in, in the speakers to sort of make the instrument seem like it's realer than life, but not really quite. It's, it's, an, it's an illusion. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to sort of cycle back, um, and I've uh, become, begun to get really um, excited about the idea of instruments resonating themselves and how could this work. Um, and so my dear friend Mike Compatello, who's a percussionist, decided to make a project called the Unsnare Drum Project. He wanted to take the most unsexy uh, instrument of the entire percussion battery, the snare drum, this like militaristic um, object and sort of create these fantastical pieces. So he commissioned uh, five women, four women, right, four women to unsnare the snare drum um, and make it exciting again. So Amy Beth Kirsten, Tonya Ko, Hannah Lash, and myself, we each sort of embarked upon these projects. Now Mike asked me if I wanted to do this. He's a really great friend. I was like, can I write you anything but a snare drum piece? Um, and he's like, no, no, it really has to be a snare drum. And I was just like, I really just don't want to do that. Um, and so uh, he often stays in my apartment when he's traveling, so one day I came back to my place and there was a snare drum set up with a bunch of mallets waiting for me, like this like, little toy to discover. Um, and I was like, okay, so I started you know, t you know, very reluctantly being like, okay, hey, how you doing? It's like, you know, if somebody doesn't like cats, you can get them to like cats by just inviting the cat in the house. Um, and so the snare drum and I lived together for a while and I, I grew, um, more intimate with it, and, and then mallets arrive from Vic Firth, so I started to actually learn how to play the snare drum. And I thought, okay, this is like really great. My neighbors wanted to kill me. This is in New York. It's just not a good idea um, to play snare drum. Actually, uh, the police came to me at a, uh, in Lawrence, Kansas, a month ago during the premiere because I was like fixing the patch at four in the morning in the hotel and they were like stop the tapping what's going on in there and then they came and I was like in bed with the snare drum after me and they're like this is really weird we weren't expecting that <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyhow um, so the idea was okay this like the snare drum is one thing this is Mike and me trying to figure out what to do with this instrument um, but I, I was like okay Mike you know what's like really easy to do with a solo uh, solo music is really hard to write by the way so you like just do solo and electronics and it becomes infinitely easier. So it's like, okay, Mike, how about snare drum and electronics? And he said, well, I have to tour with it and I can't worry about speakers and a sound guy and all this kind of stuff. And I said, uh-huh, I'm gonna turn the snare drum into its own speaker, right? Because a snare drum has two heads, it's, it's essentially a speaker. So I decided to get a transducer and stick it on the bottom of the snare drum and then put a contact mic and stick that on the side of the snare drum. And suddenly you have this amazing feedback loop sort of instrument that you can drive yourself with just a little amplifier and your laptop. Um, and then it becomes its own um, sound diffusion source. So this was really fun. Um, but what I thought would be really interesting is to sort of have all the patches that are driving the piece be synthesis patches, and instead of the computer reacting to the performance, the performer reacts to the computers playing the drum, um, and so that the human actually becomes the source of filtering and processing. So here's an example. Right, so by putting different pressure on the head of the drum, you're able to create these beating patterns out of otherwise just really simple um, sign generators that are driving the drum. And the feedback system plays further into this. Um, so this is what the setup looks like. So there's a drum, and it's really easy, and all the parts for this, you can, get, you can do all this for under 100 bucks. Um, and so when I'm uh, disseminating this kind of stuff out to the world, also with a two-toy pian two -toy piano piece, I have little packages um, that you can ship out that have the bells, the mic, the contact mics that you need, a really simple interface, um, and the Max patch with a URL that you can just download and, and put 
Um, so it makes it sort of performable and easy and accessible for people who otherwise might be scared to do this kind of work. Um, and the patch itself is very simple. You know, you basically have to put it in your machine and press a pedal, and then there's a really no big number to tell you where you are. Uh, and so here is a little demo of actually the work in progress. We had the premiere uh, about a month ago, and Mike has played it a few times, but we're in the process of still making proper documentation. But this was at a workshop at the um, Avalok Institute in New Hampshire, where we decided to get together and work on the piece. Uh, and this is video processing just from video from my phone. The idea here also being how do I take techniques that are typical for performers and sort of map them into our computer and electronic music world. So in this case, the drumsticks become filters depending on where you hit them on the edge of the snare drum. fun to play with the snare too. Because if you're driving sound into the drum and then you put the snare on, it does a whole bunch of other exciting things. Which you can see at the end. That's my bad snare drum technique, just like my bad violin technique. Um, but you know, I think it's important to <laughs> thanks really touch and play with the instruments that you're creating. Um, and so making this snare drum piece started makes, got me to start think, to think about musical games um, because I would uh, when Mike and I were collaborating on this, I would have the computer open, I could just like drive different things to him, and he would react, and I would react to what he was doing, and I thought that was kind of fun. Um, so I'm working on this crazy uh, opera that's about the Anthropocene because you know Gesamtkunst work, why not just go all the totally for it? Um, and as part of this, so the idea is you take this ice core sample and you can tell the story of how we got to where we are in Earth. So the idea is, well, we have this new sediment layer that's developing right now as a result of human intervention. And so what, did this, what is the story and how did human intervention play into this? Um, and sort of creating a narrative out of this. So we have to start with language. Um, and so one of the earlier scenes is the idea of these, this sort of like cult of um, this, uh, futuristic cult of hermits who are dedicated to preserving uh, the Anthropocene by making altars out of human garbage. Um, they do this ritual uh, to discover language, um, and so they forge words out of nothing. Um, I'm just gonna skip this video for a second. And I thought, okay, like, you know, I was really thinking about cult practices and sitting around this sort of hearth, this fire, um, and throwing dust in, into something and seeing sparks flare up. Uh, and I thought, okay, well, like, how can I make words or language out of that, and how can I turn this into some sort of wishing well? Um, so I have these uh, really beautiful metal plates that are made by a per uh, percussion maker in Fort Collins, Colorado, named Adam Morford. Um, and I got a bunch of them, and I decided to set them on foam and to stick contact mics underneath them and get bouncy balls, and people sit around uh, this sort of playground, this wishing well, and you throw the balls onto the foam. They bounce onto the different plates, um, and the plates make sounds and process, and you have sort of pitch material to work with. Um, and every time a ball hits a plate, we get a phoneme that pops up, and so I can feed this a sort of vocabulary of different words and the particles that make up words. And so as you're playing the wishing well game, and as you progress, you'll start with more simple um, phonemes, and together they eventually make words. So you can sort of uh, wish for words, um, and through singing, sound them out. Uh, and so it's kind of like Twister for singers, um, right? So every time you hit something, you get a new uh, phoneme, and as it progresses, it chooses larger and larger words until you finally get to the word, and then you can refresh vocabularies. Um, so here's... 
actually, let me show you a video where uh, people are actually playing the game. The sound's not as good here. And it's really fun for the singers too because they don't have to learn parts for this scene. They can just play the game and make it up as it goes along. So it's like a lot less stressful for them once they figure out how it works. Um, and then eventually they get together and they decide on a word. Um, and I'm not like really sure how, I mean, this, this was a really last minute thing. We were at this workshop um, right outside of Kingston for the opera um, and in this sort of really beautiful, it was a no, November, no, March of last year. Um, there's a snowstorm and we were outside of Kingston in this uh, facility that's used for ayahuasca retreats. Um, and so it's me and a bunch of singers and the conductor and a pianist, and I brought a whole bunch of musical toys. And one day I was like, oh, you know what, we should make a wishing well. Um, and so I threw those all together and I was able to just, you know, scramble a kind of idiotic max patch to make it work. And now we're sort of nuancing it and going to install this in actual proper um, set design for the opera. Um, but this idea of in uh, improvisation has become uh, a bigger thing for me. So now I'm gonna show you a piece that I, uh, or sort of a trio that is a traveling piece, it's site-specific each time we build it, um, called Sound Constructions, and it's a collaboration between myself and Lanzalotti and Sanem Perler. Uh, and so I had a residency at the Montalvo Art Center in this beautiful space, and I've been returning for years, and I finally wanted to like actually make something in the studio. Um, and so I invited these two women to come with me, and we sort of wanted to look at the environment and take the sounds from the outside and expand them and amplify them and see you know, what, what is hidden within the environmental sounds of this place. The place is covered in eucalyptus trees, which from like somebody from the East Coast, I thought this was like the most marvelous thing ever. I was like, wow, there's eucalyptus hanging everywhere. Um, and so we collected eucalyptus and a lot of spikes um, along the way, um, and then other objects, and sort of took all the furniture out of the studio and started putting contact mics and listening to the sounds that existed within these, um, and then running them through different patches in both Max and Ableton to sort of figure out what was happening. Um, so we wanted to create an improv uh, environment within the studio, but then we wanted to disseminate the sounds outside of the studio as well as a way to entice listeners to come in and to sort of look at the molecular level of what was happening in the inside and expand it outwards. So we ended up building um, these this sort of uh, DIY multi-channel system that was a bunch of uh, speaker chandeliers uh, covered with eucalyptus leaves that would allow them to, when the wind came in, to rotate and sort of have this um, really indeterminate directionality to them. Uh, so we made these beautiful, beautiful objects, um, also super cheap to do this. Um, at night, they, we lit them up so you would have reflections. Um, and this is what was happening in the studio, eventually became cleaner and neater, and they were very kind of pissed off that we took all the furniture out. Um, and so then we made these sort of weird objects that we could play and process, um, and we created this 45-minute installation, and so I had a computer running on the side that would basically listen to everything we were doing in the room, analyze it, just basically do a frequency analysis, um, and then chop that analysis up and diffuse it, and it's sort of in made up harmonic series in these speakers that would rotate outside of the studio, enticing people to come in. Um, and so I'm just gonna show you the intro bit of this. The space also at the Montalvo Art Center, which is um, in the South Bay, is really quiet but naturally noisy. Um, and the sonic landscape changes throughout the day. And so our performance started in the daytime and then ended in the evening. So we wanted to show the sort of switch of sounds that occurs and amplify that as well.
So we've constructed this now, um, this sort of performance environment that we do in several places, and we've also um, turned it into a teaching tool. So this is a workshop that was taking place both at the University of Northern Colorado and at CU Boulder, um, where we were um, having the students make, actually learn how to make contact microphones that they would use then in these um, installations. And these are um, impedance corrected, so they actually sound better. Uh, and this is a great initiative that we've partnered up with Zeppelin Design Labs, um, and they make a really great little kit. So we're trying to get people to not be scared of touching electronics. These are all, you know, classical performers, um, and and so we had them within an hour and a half soldering and making their own mics, which we thought was pretty exciting. Um, and then we went over to the Atlas Center at CU Boulder um, and sort of created this improvisation workshop where we asked the students to bring in the things that meet, like the, what objects and um, videos and images mean Colorado to them and sort of create this improv environment where they can do these sort of sound construction projects as well. Um, and I believe I'm out of time, so I'm gonna stop here. Thank you very much.